Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. Um, we're going to be reviewing a book, which I know may come as a little bit of a surprise, because we had said there was going to be a holiday beach episode this mm-hmm. week. Uh, due to some uh, technical difficulties, uh, if you didn't see that live um, or shortly after it being posted to Facebook, sadly, that is lost to the ages now. I don't know. Rob might have a copy on his computer. Essentially, um, not fit for for public broadcast. Yeah. So sorry. You should have been around Saturday night. I that's guess is what uh, I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah, that's a lesson to you. More exclusive even than if you uh, pay pay for some Patreon pr- pr- privileges. Yeah, that's that was a little too much alliteration. I, I got caught up in that. But um, yeah. Uh, sadly, that episode will not be an episode, so we can consider it the lost episode. And that's actually an interesting point. We've gone 410 episodes. Have we lost anything? We've had to um, re-record one yeah. thing. Yeah, like episode three where we didn't record it. Well, there was a holiday episode, the Easter episode. Oh, there was that too, we, yeah. We had a recording go bad or something, so we had to re-record. We figured it out halfway through, though, and mm-hmm. we recovered from it. And actually, like, I think it became a much better episode with that. Um, but this is our first like official lost episode, I think. I believe, uh, I believe, no, man, really early on, you and I went through a whole hour long review. Mm-hmm. Might have been like episode three or four, and you were like, nothing recorded. Did we redo it or did we just skip it? Oh, no, we redid it. Okay. We this, redid it. This we're just utterly abandoning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, it happens. And yeah. you know what? In place, we emergency read a book. So today. <laughs> yeah, the people, um, the Robin Livius of 2017 would be like, who the hell are these people? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So essentially, we're recording this on Tuesday, the 28th of August, and today would have been probably the day that that episode would have landed. Um, On Sunday, the day after the recording, we found out we weren't going to be able to use that one. So we, I, it took 26 hours to read this book, not continuously reading, but between working and sleeping and stuff. We turned this thing around super goddamn quick. Yeah, we did. Proud of us. So any rate, now that that's out of the way, let me explain to you what you're going to be hearing, because this might be a little weird for you. Um, Rob had the idea that, um, let me back up a little bit. We have read <laughs> some books by some people uh, who maybe we haven't read other books from, or because we only read typically books that are very fresh and new, that we go, oh, this person has had some great books, so we're going to review their new book. And invariably... The new book is a letdown. Mm-hmm. Is that fair? Oh, all the time. It happens yep. so much. So, or, or at least not not to the level that we know this author is capable. Correct. Yeah. So Rob had the great idea that occasionally, and 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 a lot to be honest, in in kind of like a filler episode fashion. Sometimes we'll find ourselves with a gap week where we just don't really have anything slotted. That we take an author and read their most notable would that be a fair way to say it yeah they're like yeah their best yeah. work yeah their best work what, what typically is considered you know their most notable or best work so that's what we're doing um tonight for people who aren't familiar uh rob is a huge fan of kurt vonnegut jr um uh, has read everything by him i believe at least all of his fiction works is that correct yeah all of his fiction and a majority of his his essays I have uh, only read, I think, two of his books. I know Slaughterhouse Five was one of them, and the other one eludes me. Um, at Rob's behest, many, many years ago, pre-podcast. Um, but I have never read Sirens of Titan, and Rob chose this as uh, is this is this commonly thought of as his best book? Or, well, I know the first thing that people are going to say is that Slaughterhouse Five would, would maybe be kind of heralded as his greatest work. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely his most widely known work, but I would say that like of the people who are familiar with like the entire breadth of his work, Sirens of Titan is usually the high, most high regarded. So, uh, that's what we're going to be uh, reviewing tonight. I am going to give you the bio for Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Kurt was born in 1922 and died in 2007. He was an American writer. In a career spanning over 50 years, Vonnegut published 14 novels, three short story collections, five plays, and five works of nonfiction. He is most famous for his darkly satirical best-selling novel, Slaughterhouse-Five, which was written in 1969. Um, That's more novels than I thought he wrote. Yeah. 
he hit his he he got he didn't get popular till Slaughterhouse Five was like his sixth novel, and that's when he actually became like like a celebrity author. Like he became a celebrated author six books in, which is pretty wild. Like so, it took him a, over a, his first book was published in 1952, and he hit with Slaughterhouse Five, which was 1969. So that was what 17 years. Mm-hmm. Before he actually like really hit his stride, how did you get into Kurt Vonnegut? How did I get? Well, I mean, you know, early twenties. I like to read a lot of books, and you just talk to other people who like to read books, and they're like, "Oh, you have to read Kurt Vonnegut." And then, um, I think the first book that was recommended for me to read of his was Cat's Cradle, or maybe it was Breakfast of Champions. One or the other. I didn't like Cat's Cradle as much as I liked the other books, but um, I liked him enough to keep keep going with it. And within about a year, I think I'd read every all of his 14 novels, and then I think three or so. Uh, uh, all of his novels and his short story collections. Yeah, 17 books. And then I kind of picked away at some of the other stuff later on. But yeah, within about a year to two, two years, I'd gone through the 17 main fiction books. Now, from what I remember of the books that I read of his and this, they all kind of have very similar tone feel yeah. cadence cadence is probably the word I'm looking for mm-hmm. after reading all those in a year. And I imagine you probably read them pretty much straight through it. It, it almost had to be hard to like switch off and read something else. <laughs> yeah. He's got, um, yeah. And, and I'm, I have a quote from Douglas Adams that we're going to go to later on that kind of, but like casual, very casual and like cynical almost. Right. Mm-hmm. But like in a simple way, yeah. 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 So jumping from that to like reading Fight Club would be a little bit of a, a change. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. All right. You want to give uh, everybody the synopsis and we'll get into this. Oh, it should be noted because this book is nearly 60 years old. Um, we are going to um, uh, abandon our spoiler free review um, yeah. pattern that we have. Our, our, yeah. our, this is going to be spoiler filled. Um, so it's going to be more of a book discussion than a, than a review. We're going to talk about it all the way through. So, um, if it's something you want to read, I mean, I hate telling people stop listening, but probably stop listening, read it in 26 hours and then come back and listen. That's probably the best advice I can give you. Now, let's be honest. You've had the better part of a century to read this book. No shit. So we're not going to feel bad about kind of spoiling it, but, um, yeah, here's the synopsis of Sirens of Titan. It is an outrageous romp through space, time, and morality. The richest, most depraved man on Earth, Malachi Constant, is offered a chance to take a space journey to distant worlds with a beautiful woman at his side. Of course, there's a catch to the invitation and a prophetic vision about the purpose of human life that only Vonnegut has the courage to tell. You want to talk about that synopsis? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a little off. To start. So Malachi Constant is offered a chance to take a space journey. Um, and, and he is offered to take it with a beautiful woman. But he completely declines doing that. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then winds up doing it anyway. But um, kind of inadvertently against his will. Sort of. I take issue with offered a chance. It's basically yeah. prophesized that he will go. He yep. fights the prophecy and ends up going. Correct. Um, one of the reasons I, I figured it would be best to use spoilers is that talking about the book without spoiling it is a difficult and B would probably be very boring. So like the idea of trying to write a synopsis for this book at all to me would be a little bit of a challenge. So I'm not really going to hold much against the synopsis because try like summing up this book to someone. Well, the thing I wonder too, and there's probably a way to find out. So the synopsis came from Barnes and Noble.com. Mm hmm. For various reasons. Um, I wonder if this is the original synopsis, or I wonder if synopsis is synopsis. They change. If they change, yeah. They do. Um, I've I, in, in setting up the information that we're looking at for this episode, um, I went to several websites, uh, and there's different synopses based on the publisher. So, like, if you went to A Books, for example, and you found, like, an earlier printing of this book and they, you know, and they included the synopsis in the description, it would be entirely different. So yeah, I don't know who does that, but it's, it's based on the publisher. The publisher creates the, the synopsis. 
So getting into our story, we will start at the beginning and then we'll probably move somewhere into the end and then kind of come back because that's really, <laughs> I think, the only yep. way to tell this story. So we're introduced to Malachi Constant. He is uh, the closest thing we have to a protagonist in this book. He is a multi-billionaire who has made all of his money off a system um, that, that he considers luck, although it's, that's not quite all there is to it. Um, he, he just keeps amassing and buying companies and investing in companies and making the right decision turn after turn after turn. And he's just super careless about it. Like he lives his life as a, uh, although it's not really explicit and there is suggested that he kind of lives his life as like a billionaire playboy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he runs into, uh, uh, here's where the book goes really weird. He is invited to meet somebody who has gone to outer space and now only comes back through materializing in his own home. So this guy's also rich, although not nearly as rich. And his name is Winston Niles Roomford. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I, through some kind of weird sci-fi shit that I don't understand, went to a place <laughs> in space that allows him to see all of the future and all of the past. Um. It, but then c to continue to come back on a regular basis, not just to Earth, but to other places in the universe. Yeah, and exist in multiple places at the same time. Yeah, so um, a little weird and tricky there with, with that, but you just kind of have to accept that that's, <laughs> that's how it works. So at any rate, he's invited to the materialization, which nobody is invited to. And uh, Rumford um, explains to Malachi what's going on, but also explains to him his own future. And he tells him... You are going to go to Mars, then you're going to go to Mercury, then you're going to come back to Earth, and then you're going to end up on Titan. And through the course of all of this, you and my wife will have a child. And that's essentially the whole the whole prophecy, right? Yeah. 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 And because this guy knows the future, and it is believed that he knows the future because he is a sort of demonstrated that um you know there are a lot of people that believe that all of this will come true or that anything he says will come true uh, malachi is not one of them and he says yeah you know what go pound sand um i'm a billionaire i'm perfectly happy where i'm at no interest in going to mars no interest in banging your old lady um i'm just gonna go do my thing winston's wife feels very similarly that she does not want to be told who she's going to have a child with. And she also doesn't want to go to Mars. She just wants to kind of continue living her somewhat plush lifestyle. Man, you're really nailing this. So the uh, interesting thing about it is even though they both don't want that outcome, um, Malachi and Beatrice, who is the wife that was mentioned before, both do what they can to sabotage the potential for that outcome. So they kind of fight against the the prophecy. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, well, unfortunately for them, but like, you know, as the story kind of pro prophesies, like that does actually come to pass. Um, through a lot of the, in some ways, through the things that they did themselves. Right. Like uh, Malachi... Um, <laughs> How long was that party? He threw a party that lasted like... 53 days, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and the wife, yeah, with business dealings and other things too, tries to kind of like sabotage the possibility of that outcome. And um, to no avail because, because it eventually does happen. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention that one of uh, one of the the pitfalls of of Malachi is <laughs> during the course of this party he starts giving one oil well to every like hottie that's at his party, and he gives away like a hundred something oil wells <laughs> over the course of fifty three days. Like you get an oil well, and you can have an oil well, and like, you have an oil well. And the thing, what did what did the woman? He would give an oil well to any woman who said like I'm big, I'm a bigger whore than your mother or something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah, something like that. Yep. There was a whole drunken like philosophy behind like mm -hmm. how it was okay to be a whore or something. I don't remember, but yeah, um, we, you find out later on that actually his mom kind of was a was a whore. Yeah, in like you know in the oldest profession kind of way. Yep, she would. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of interesting because I don't think there was quite enough in there about Malachi's dad. So here's what's interesting about him: he has an idea 
<laughs> this is so crazy. He opens up the Bible and splits each um, Bible verse, or at the beginning of the Bible, he's each Bible verse um, into two letters. So in, I believe, is the first word, right? In the beginning. Isn't that the sure. first? So, so it's in is I-N, and then the T-H from the, and then the E-B from the end of the, and the beginning. And he rotates investments in companies whose uh, stock market tickers are those are those letters and just has ridiculous success one after the other after the other. But he's not interested in being wealthy. He's a loner who lives his whole life in this motel room that he starts this in, like buys the motel, doesn't change anything. And then Malachi's mother is a she was a cleaning lady, right? Yeah, she's like a maid Yeah, with whom he arranged for her to come by every 10 days and put out. Yeah. Paid her to have sex every 10 days. So he has this thing where he winds up making a billion dollars or whatever it was that his father actually made with no interest in anything but working, but working a system like he is not what Malachi becomes. He is not the billionaire playboy like he's got. He's got his constant, you know, you know, sex from this woman and essentially doesn't leave his his hotel room very often. (laughs) <laughs> so he's kind of an interesting character. I, I kind of felt like I would have liked to have known a little bit more about him. Yeah. So, and it's not long into the book before we actually start heading out to Mars, correct? Yeah. So through a series of uh, misfortunes, um, Malachi and Beatrice wind up on the same shuttle to Mars, although they don't know it at the time. Uh, Malachi finally begrudgingly accepts because he is completely broke. And at this point, what the fuck, right? Beatrice, although it's never, I don't think it's ever made really clear, but it sounds like she's kind of tricked into it or maybe even kidnapped into going to Mars. Yeah, yeah. she's because she's in a room drugged. So I'm guessing she definitely was taken against her will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, in, the, in the course of the trip to Mars, which um, is, I'm guessing, way shorter than uh, what we it would take, like you or I in a spaceship to get to Mars today. Um, he's having some drunken revelry with the other people on the ship and they're talking about the only thing you can't do is go in this room. This beautiful woman is there, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, you know, I've had all the beautiful women and like, this is back and forth. And finally he's like, well, I'm going to conquer this woman. And he basically rapes her. He like date rapes her minus Mm -hmm. the date. So I guess it's just rape. Yeah. Yes. Um, Mathematically speaking, if you put date rape on one line, (laughs) you put a little minus on the next line and yeah that's well i was thinking you there the was, one usually there's that's drugs involved with the date rape yeah that's true and there was drugs involved so that's where i was i wasn't Correct. trying to minimize i got you. the the hideousness yeah I, I, let's stop there for a second before we move on from that that was a little jarring yep like i know we we're supposed to feel a little bit um the, the book is, is written in a way where you're supposed to kind of feel like, well, Malachi just keeps lucking into shit and you're supposed to not really like him. But honestly, up until that point, I felt like he was a really likable guy. He's just giving out oil wells and even his uh, his interactions with Beatrice, like when it's just the two of them mm-hmm. and, you know, and they're, they're kind of telling each other off. Like I was like, I kind of like this cat. Like, like he's OK. So I didn't feel I didn't like him. So it was super jarring. And I don't know if that was. Maybe in 1960, whatever year this was written, maybe a character like Malachi was just completely unlikable from the way the story is told. And maybe well, it wasn't. I'm wondering, it, too. Yeah, the book was published in 59. So you have to imagine this is a 1950s gentleman like women definitely different that had a different kind of station. You know, they were mm-hmm. much less equal and in, in, in especially they were much more objectified. And so I'm wondering if maybe a drunken guy full of bravado uh, taking advantage of a woman was not as big of a deal then as it is now. Oh, see, you're going the other route. Right. I was going the maybe he was more unlikable before, but, you know, because of the I don't know, whatever, because of the fiction we take in now or movies or whatever. I was like, oh, this guy's all right. He's a little bit of an exploitative billionaire. Like, I kind of like the guy. Yeah. So either way, a repulsive act, obviously. Um but then he does feel remorse about it to to a, to an extent, like he feels like he feels kind of repulsed by himself. Um, but then they're in Mars, like suddenly they're just you know it jumps forward like eight years, right, or six mm-hmm. years or something like that. Mars is uh, is weird. So Mars has been colonized by people from Earth. 
uh, to build an army to attack the Earth. Which I realize sounds a little crazy, and it is, but yeah. it all serves uh, serves the the greater purpose of the story, right? Yep. One of the interesting things there is that um, most people, uh, so either you're you're put in a leadership role, and then most of those people get to keep their uh, their memories and, and their their you know personalities or whatever. Everybody else, essentially, their little mind is uh, is erased, like like you would take a melon baller to a to a honeydew or something, right? <laughs> like and it scoops out all your memories of who you are. And you're implanted with an antenna, um, which controls all of your your activity. So when it's time to march, you march. And if you don't march, you get like a terrible, terrible headache, like like you know, just debilitating pain. Yeah. So that's where we run into Malachi again in this jump forward. He's no longer Malachi. He is known as Unk, U N K Unk. Um, and uh, we we meet him after he has just had a second brain erasure. Um, and he is uh, his first task that he is given is to go to the public execution square and execute um, by strangling um, a, a member of the military that had done something wrong. Yeah. And this this the Mars, the on Mars part of the book is 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 weird because it's very stark and very um almost dystopian even though it's not dystopian but you know what i mean like it's a it's a dreary bleak future kind of thing mm -hmm. um and yeah so like the whole the whole idea is um the mars the martian army um feels that the best way to be effective is for people to not think and so they just basically wipe everybody's memories out the only exception is there's some secret kind of planted people within the common army who are actually people who are in control regardless of the rank that they carry and they're people who don't have their memories erased and they control um their whatever you want to say group that they're in mm -hmm. um, yeah they're essentially leadership kind of undercover though yeah they're like undercover boss yes but, yeah, very, yes yeah. yeah but with like a mind zapper and um there's the story on Mars is kind of brief, but basically after the execution, Unk, um, at, as he was killing this person, the person whispered something to Unk about a location of something. So when he has a free moment, he goes to the location and he finds a letter written to him from the uh, first Eric Sanders from the first Eric Sanderson. Yeah. Um, from a, from an earlier version of himself, basically yeah. saying like, Here's this. Be careful of this. It's almost like a like a the memento of the movie. Mm -hmm. Like don't believe their lies, kind of thing. Like he's guiding himself through how to act and how to survive and what's good and what's bad and and everything. And um, based on that, he decides he's going to find his wife and kid that he discovers that he has in this letter and get away. And not long after this whole public execution is when the army of Mars is going to mobilize to attack earth. So, uh, not a lot of time spent on Mars, but a lot of weird, strange things do happen. I don't want to keep detailing the book. Um, this book is fucking weird. It's really weird. So suffice <laughs> it to say, and we'll talk about some more things as they come up, I guess, but the prophecies all come true. Yeah. Um, it's and this is this is where I kind of want to spend a little bit of time and maybe you have some insight that I don't or or whatever. But I will um, say this is probably the fourth time I've read this book. Okay, which which is so. is good because sometimes knowing when you're going in, there may be clues mm -hmm. um, to, to things that I miss, not really knowing. I mean, I had a good idea where the story was going. You know, I mean, the second right. that they both end up on that ship to Mars, I'm like, oh, we I know we're going to Mercury. I know we're going back to Earth. Yep. You know what I mean? Like I, I had that feeling. <laughs> yep. Um, the way it works out, it's it's Winston is prophesizing the future. So basically, it's it's treated as destiny, and that no matter what Unk does, he's going to follow these steps. Correct. Yeah, because Winston knows what the future is. So, but Winston yeah. is also making the future happen. So this becomes one of those really tricky things about and, and I'll call this time travel because Winston can exist in multiple places at once. But really, when he's telling the future, it, it's I had this challenge throughout the book that I kept running into of 
you know, can Malachi actually break what happens? I had a feeling he wouldn't. But because Winston controls the entire narrative, so everything that happens, although it's prophesied in the future, all of it is due to what Winston is doing. So I'll give you some examples, right? And, and I'm sure there's more than this. But he only winds up on Mercury because Winston programs the ship to go to Mercury. Yep. He only gets out of Mercury because Winston tells him how to get out of Mercury. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? He winds up back on Earth, and then Winston manipulates him into going to Titan. So, I mean, everything yeah. is done by Winston manipulating it. So I understand that Winston can tell the future, but there was nothing in this book, at least that I caught in my reading, that indicates that it was fate. Because it was Winston manipulating it at every turn. So that's kind of like me saying, hey, I can tell the future. Next week, we're going to review this book. And we're probably going to do it on Tuesday. And then I already know a book we're reviewing. And I already know what date we're going to. You know what I'm saying? Like, And then I call you up and say, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do it on Tuesday. And you go, okay. And I go, well, see, I predicted the future. Which is a lame example. But that's a little bit like how I felt about Winston's prediction of the future. Is that he was making it occur. Yeah. So it's a little less fate than manipulation by him. If that were the only layer of manipulation, you'd be right. But you have to consider the layer of manipulation on Winston, which sure. is Tralfamador. Yes. Um, and so that's where it gets interesting because, like, um, especially – so basically we'll, we'll fast forward through, like, scenes of the book. Um, Mars attacks Earth in, to spectacular failure. Almost everybody dies. And the whole plot of Mars attacking Earth was basically to unite Earth in a in a single brotherhood against a common foe, so to to bring the entire world together, and it was successful for the most part. Um, so it's like um, the Watchmen, right? That Alan Moore. Comic yeah, book. I I can't say for sure because I I tried to watch the movie once and oh. and yeah, I don't even think I saw the whole thing. So. Well, the, oh, okay, so. Anyway, there's a plot similar where there's this giant monster that's supposed to, like, bring the world together to fight this giant monster, and then we're not fighting each other. Same kind of thing. Um, And that was the goal of Mars attacking Earth, was to bring Earth together, united in a religion that was created by by Winston. and um, Which which I guess we should pause there. Which is really kind of like an anti-religion. Yeah. Um, kind of, it yeah. was called what was it called the 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 church of the uncaring god what was it um no oh, the the church of god the utterly indifferent yeah that's it yeah yeah yep and that's the whole like and that's very vonnegut <laughs> i will say that right now um but yeah so like um that all works out the the ship takes them to Mercury, and they're kind of marooned there for a while, and that was just because Con- uh, Winston didn't want Malachi to get killed in the initial attack on Earth, and he wanted to set up the return of the Space Traveler later, the reveal that it was Malachi constant, so that, you know, Earth people would learn a lesson. Malachi and B would flee to Titan and live out their days there. Um, and that all happens. Like, it all happens according exactly to what... Winston Niles Rumford wanted to happen. Um, and it's really in the last, I don't know, 40, 50 pages, really, where, like, the other layer of the, the more insidious kind of layer of manipulation is revealed when everybody's on Titan. Um, it's revealed that Winston is always on Titan, even when he's in other places. So he's kind of, like, consistently living there with an alien named Salo. You say Salo or Salo? I say Salo. I was, I was saying Salo in my head, but I'm okay with it either way. Either way. Um, who has the skin that looks like a tangerine, but he's a robot. Um, really kind of freaky the way it was described. Three legs, a bunch of eyes, no arms. Yeah, and, and his head his head is on a on a gimbal. Yeah. Do you know what a, do you know what a gimbal is? I mean, if it's the kind of thing, yeah. I know yeah, like was. used with like a camera or whatever yeah. to keep it steady. Yeah, yeah. And that was kind of interesting. His head would just kind of flip around on the gimbal. Yeah. <laughs> there was some pretty <laughs> weird shit happening there. Um, and so that's where it's revealed uh, through casual conversation between um, Sallow and Roomford that like uh, Sallow, first of all, had become he is a he, he's from. I'm gonna back it up a little bit, just tell you a little bit about him. 
He's from uh, his planet, and he was sent out as a messenger to the other side of the galaxy to, with a very special message, but his he, he became shipwrecked on Titan and needed to get a part replaced. And that was before basically the entire history of, of Earth. And um, oh, where was I going with this? The reason for all yeah. of it. So anyway, um, I'm going to skip that for now because it's a great reveal. Um, he is is the the means that Roomfort needs to to make the whole Mars thing happen. He has his spaceship has something called the Universal Will to Become. Right? Is that what it was called? Mm-hmm. Which is the power source, which is like the most like the biggest power source, the the most powerful power source that you can have, and he shares that with him to create the Martian army. Martian Army's ships are based off of Salo, so everything, and he even helps kind of plan the attack and um, helps kind of figure out how to recruit people. So Salo basically helps make the entire Mars attack happen, and all of Roomford's manipulations of the people of Earth and his wife and Malachi Constant are all assisted by Salo. I want to say that... Um... One of the disappointments I had in this book was that we didn't really meet Sallow, although he was mentioned that it takes, like you said, to the last like 40 pages or whatever. Yeah, it's the last 15 percent of the book, I think, um, that Sallow actually becomes a character because I really thought he was one of the most interesting characters in this book. Mm -hmm. And I will I'm not going to I mean, we talk about character development or whatever. Quite honestly, he's probably one of the better developed characters in this book, too. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it's, it's a little, it's a little disappointing that you meet him and you're like, this is a great fucking, ca- oh, the fucking book's over <laughs> essentially. So did you hear that lightning outside? Holy shit. Yes, I did. That was on my side, right? Yeah, it was. Cause it sounded like you were fucking banging your desk around or something. It made me jump. Yeah. <laughs> Don't bad talk shallow. Yeah. No kidding. Um, um so um, that's, that's his, uh, that's his kind of effect on, on Roomford, but the backstory that we learned that even Winston didn't know, um, that we learned first and then Roomford eventually discovers is that when he became marooned on Titan, um, he, Stallo messages home and says, Hey, I need this part. He gets a message back saying, Hey, we got you covered. And there's some kind of back and forth messaging uh, about that. And, um, the way that the the most efficient way for his planet to get him the part he needs is to basically manipulate Earth's population in a way that will have them create the part and get it to Sallow. So, like, so many of the significant parts of human history were the the home planet of Sallow trying to get the civilizations to, to f- help fix the maroon ship, which is just like pretty fucking crazy, right? Yeah. And for anybody who's not clear, not that you didn't do a good job of explaining it. <laughs> um, can you hear the rain? Does rain? Wow. Yeah. The rain is just pounding the shit out of the fucking window. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. We oh, may wow. have to pause. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's pause for a couple wild. minutes if you don't mind. See if that passes because I can hear it through my headphones really clearly. So I imagine it's coming through the mic. Oh my god! Yeah, this is what it was like driving today. I mean, there are times where I could maybe see two car lengths ahead. Dude. Yeah, I guess stopping the recording is probably good, too, because there's always a chance of a power outage, and you're on That's a, what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, you're on a desktop computer, so... Yep. Um. Yep. Once... So did I... All right, so when I was a kid... During a thunderstorm, um, once I got the whole explanation of like what's 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 happening, what's that noise, and I got the whole like the man upstairs is bowling. Yeah. 
Are you there? Did I lose you? Uh oh. Libius. Hey, buddy, you with me? All right, just uh, for everybody that's listening, uh, you probably heard at least some some serious lightning and discussion about crazy lightning and maybe also some rain pounding in, in, on Livius' house. So I want to explain that um, soon after the, the crazy weather happened, Livius actually lost power for several hours, and so we were unable to finish recording this episode. And so this is the following evening where we're picking up where we left off. So if it seems like the conversation was, doesn't go as completely smoothly as, as usually it does. It's because we're like f f 24 hours later. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to say, um, yeah, so this is the longest it's ever taken us to record an episode. So there's a historic moment. Yeah. <laughs> also, I think it's adorable that you think most of our conversations go smoothly. Oh, oh, I think they do. I, I have to listen to them multiple times, and I think they do. Oh, that's true. You do listen to them more so. than I do. Maybe that's uh, my, I don't know. Yeah. All right, but before we get back into it, uh, Rob, <laughs> send a message, Rob, and tell him, hey, my power is out. Um, and then he, <laughs> he, he launched very passionately into telling me this this story about his childhood, which is, is super fitting because of the weather issues and stuff. And I think, uh, Rob, would you kindly take a moment and share that with uh, with our listeners? Yeah, as Livius and I were kind of, um, and, I'll, and I'll put what we had in the recording, um, we were talking... It, but bef like we were giving ourselves a buffer before we uh, started going back into the episode. I started talking about um, how when I was a little kid, and I'm talking probably like, you know, pre-kindergarten, it was like super stormy and there was lightning happening and everything. And I was raised not religious. But anyway, so um, I w asked what the noise was. And the answer was, oh, the man upstairs is bowling. And it's like, oh, ha, it's a cute thing to tell kids or whatever. But having not been raised religious, I didn't have the context of, like, calling God the man upstairs. And so I literally thought as a kid that, like, the guy that lived above us was bowling. And it was like, I, I was like, well, that's rude. Like, that was my, why doesn't you just cut that out? That was such a cute story. That happens a lot so. with kids. Um <laughs> Yeah. Like as adults, we kind of forget how to speak to children and like, what's the word for that? That would be like, it's not even an analogy. What is that called? Is it, it's not allegory. I'm, uh, uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's allegory. At any rate, we forget about those things, right? And kids are super, super literal. That's all they understand. Yeah. So yeah, it can be, uh, it can be adorable. That's also why Rob has never had an upstairs neighbor ever in his whole existence. <laughs> like these sons of bitches are always bowling. Yeah, exactly. Like clockwork. Every time it rains, they're like breaking out the bowling balls. It's <laughs> talking to you. You're about to sign. Lisa, you go, hold on a second. <laughs> Is there anything in here that prohibits bowling? They're like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's like, I don't want to live around there. Someone that's bowling. <laughs> then I signed the lease. shit when I was a kid. <laughs> Cut to like three months later. I'm calling my landlord. You son of a bitch. You told me there would be no bowling. Yeah, no kidding. All right, let's see if we can get this uh, this bad boy back on track. <laughs> Hopefully, the weather. I checked the weather. No rain in the Ooh, forecast, good. so we should uh, we should be okay. I was out of power, by the way. It was two and a half hours, so it was that a brief stint? Although definitely not the longest I've ever gone. Wow. Yeah. So um, we were talking about uh, Sallow and his uh, his Tralfamadorian um, race. So. I wanted to elaborate a little bit, and I know this is a little spaced out now because of all the the you know stuff that happened. But um, you know, Rob had said that they used uh, the human race um, to get this part to fix this ship, um, which is very true. Um, I'm going to give you a, just a couple of examples, but really, he crashed on that planet and sent a message like 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago or whatever. So it was a really long time ago. Essentially, the gist of Vonnegut's book is that everything we've done has been in service of getting this part to Salo, Salo, whatever we decided on, um, for his spaceship. So, for example, like the one that I really liked was Stonehenge was a message saying your part is on its way or something along those lines because he can <laughs> see Earth yeah. through some kind of telescope on his ship or whatever. So they would <laughs> sending these messages and that the whole thing 
was formulated by them to get him to continue on his journey, um, which is really interesting because it goes back to that seeing the future thing a little bit. So mm-hmm. we have uh, Winston, who's manipulating everybody um, to, to get into position of the future that he saw. But he's being manipulated by Sallow, who really this is all about getting a part for his like, you know, you know, whatever, 76 Mustang or whatever it is that he's uh, he's riding <laughs> through outer space. Yeah. And that's the part that um, uh, kind of it doesn't excuse the actions of of Rumford, but at the same time. He's being influenced, and he, in his conversation with Sallow, in like a very bitter conversation with Sallow, um, where he, uh, Sallow discovers that Rumford knows more about the Tralfamador like uh, influence than than maybe he let on. Um, he basically, you know, acknowledges that you know the th- the things that he were doing, he was doing, you know, whether they were or not. He he has no way of knowing if he chose to do them or if it was the Tralfamador people influencing him. So um, it's like this cascade of like the, you know, this alien planet is influencing earth for its selfish needs, which includes influencing Rumford who then influences earth for his selfish, like, you know, kind of goals and stuff like that. And, and it's just this whole big analysis of, of free will. So it's, it's, it's interesting. I, uh, yes, I agree about the free will, but it also struck me that it was a little bit of a jab at how insignificant we really are. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That we, we think we're here and there's always a reason for us to be here and we're supposed to do. And when I say we, I don't personally think there's any reason for me to be here, but you know what I mean? As a, as a society, we kind of believe that, but it seemed that Vonnegut was kind of saying like, Hey, you guys are taking yourselves way too seriously. I mean, in this particular story, he made us the, um, the, the, I worked at an auto parts store for like three weeks when I was like 20 mm-hmm. and I worked at one of those auto parts stores where we had like these two old guys whose job it was, uh, like if you owned a mechanic shop, you would call up and you'd say, Hey, I need a, a part for my 76 Ford Mustang. I, I need a, you know, whatever, a muffler. And I'd go up mufflers, 20, you know, $8 or whatever. I'm sure mufflers are more than that, but you get the idea. And they go, yeah, can you go ahead and send that over? So we would put it like on their tab Mm -hmm. and then the old guy would drive it over. So Vonnegut (laughs) turned the entire, uh, where where are we at? How many billion people, 8 billion people on earth are all, um, are all that delivery driver just trying to get a part to someone that needs to fix a vehicle. It's real true, and like, and there are like some overt um, discussions about like purpose in the book um, mm-hmm. from different characters' perspectives. But that's kind of ultimately, I think, a lot of uh, having read so much Vonnegut, that is so like such a cornerstone of the the like the meaning behind what he writes is like, um, what our you know what is our purpose in life? What a you know examining the idea of a higher power obviously he was an atheist and and a humanist um and and so his beliefs on on purpose and why we're here and what happens when you're dying and all that kind of stuff is very this all this all is very representative of of those types of things but yeah um overall like the meaninglessness or or the way that we kind of dress things up with meaning that we have no idea if that's really what you know, we had our own significance, but it might overall be nothing. Yeah. Would you kindly um, explain to me what a humanist is? Oh, I knew you were going to do that to me. Um, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the humanism, like Wikipedia, humanism.org. Um, I don't know if that's a thing. Philosophical and ethical stance that emphasizes the value and agency of human beings individually and collectively and generally prefers critical thinking and evidence over acceptance of dogma and superstition. Um, Modern times, humanist movements are typically non-religious movements aligned with secularism. And today, humanism typically refers to a non-theistic life stance centered on human agency and looking to science rather than revelation from a supernatural source to understand the world. Got it. Yeah. Another noted humanist uh, is Joss Whedon, who 
um, made Buffy the Vampire Slayer and um, Kevin in the Woods and was it you know now he's doing comic book movies but the the so thing... wait so essentially you're saying a guy who doesn't believe in in uh, supernatural agency just does entertainment about supernatural stuff is that am I yeah getting but it's that like right? the okay. deeper message behind it so like uh, you've seen Kevin in the Woods yes like that ending where they're like well maybe maybe it's not our time anymore mm-hmm. that is 100 percent like a humanist thing like what gotcha. you know what gives us the right to think that we are the right thing for the world that kind of thing yeah so um yeah so i guess humanism is an atheist with a strong scientific yeah i mean i mean that's prob- probably right the the difference between the two yeah one of them is a, a little more science focused more proof more rational Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, I, I believe what I can see. Um, I don't have any real in- insight into like what the afterlife is, I'm guessing, because there's no way to know like that type of thing. Sure. Got uh, it. Yeah. Probably leaning a lot towards the things that I believe. When I think of it. You are, um, a humanist. Maybe. I don't know. If I, I don't know hate humans. That, I don't think you're that science heavy. No. <laughs> so anyway. Um, yeah, I'm, I lean toward fun. <laughs> You're a funnist. I'm a fun, yeah, fun. I, I was even, gonna say yeah. funnist, but then it makes it sound like you just eat those <laughs> like fried those onions, chips. Yeah. yeah, those those potato chips I'll or whatever they are. Any rate, we're way off track. Um, yeah. So that's it. That's really that's really what we have from a story standpoint, right? I mean, we've kind of taken everybody through the whole the whole reveal of this book is that um, we have only served the purpose of repairing a spaceship. I guess it's, it merits touching on that. We do find out what the, um, the message that Salo is carrying across the universe mm-hmm. is. Yeah. And it's a message. that just says, what up? It says <laughs> literally greetings. greetings. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Greetings. That's um, it. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, that's so marvelous too, because, um, it, it's so like the amount of suffering, and like the highs and lows and like the, the influencing of an entire like civilization, like the history of a civilization is all so that one person could maybe eventually deliver hello to someone like it's so meaningless. Then it's mm-hmm. caused all of that shit to happen. It's fucking amazing. <laughs> I had um, one um, question concern thing that was bothering me, something along those lines. Uh, Malachi, uh, Malachi, the name means messenger, right? Mm -hmm. And that's all he wanted to do in his life at some point was, was be his namesake, right? And, and deliver an important message. Um, now I, I know it's hard for you to remember back to the first time you read this, I'm sure Mm -hmm. I I was kind of expecting, Oh, like him to pick up the mantle or something. Well, okay. So yeah, without elaborating too much, right? Salo is essentially destroyed. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. Malachi is going to continue on this journey for him and and he'll have gotten what he always dreamed of. Because, I mean, you know, what what are the chances he meets another important messenger? Well, but, but, you know, alleged important messenger, I guess, depends on the message. So I'm a little little um, miffed that that we didn't go that route um, while reading this book. Yeah. And I can see where that would be uh, narratively um, like. Uh, uh, efficient or what's the word I'm looking for? Graceful, effective. Mm-hmm. But you got to remember, Malachi Constant, Constant is a piece of shit. Like he's not a good person. Like he doesn't deserve. I mean, like he had, he had his like redemption through like. You well, know, that's but, what I yeah. Because it, it, becoming it, Unk, he becomes a much better person. But it took like someone actually literally taking his brain away from him to make him like to give him the opportunity to be not a piece of garbage. Um, mm-hmm. and that's that's how I take it. I don't know if that was like obviously the the intent, um, but I, I see where you're going, and I really hadn't ever made that connection, which is kind of funny. But because um, I never really thought, I I got so caught up in the fact that Salo at the end of the book, like you said earlier, was the most well developed character. He was also the most human, probably, of the characters that we we interact with in the book. Um, of the main characters. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Being a robot. <laughs> so, um, and, and his like just desperate need to have friendship with Roomford was kind of the, 
that's that's so I framed him so much that way that I never thought about like the 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 messenger parallel. So it's interesting that you said that. Well, yeah, and even uh, Unk, we'll call him Unk for for the sake of this. Like he wants to, you know, uh, save his mate and he wants to save his son. But I think almost more out of a sense of duty than a sense of caring. Um, the only character he cared for, I forget his name. It's the guy that he kills. Stony? Is it yeah, Stony? Stony. Stony Stevenson or something like so, that? So, yeah, his his relationship with it, that we don't really see at all, mm-hmm. essentially, in the book is is the closest thing to a, a real relationship uh, other than Sallow's, you know, uh, a- adoration of Winston. Right. So yeah. those are the only two people that have any real legit tie to one another. I mean, even even um, B's relationship with her son is kind of just, you know, and, and part of this is given to uh, to the fact that, you know, on Mars, you're kind of erased of your, you know, kind of desires to mate or to whatever. So it seems like yeah. it was more of a, a very clinical relationship, like she cared for him because it was her son and she kind of had to. Right. Rather than having a true love. So, yeah, Sallow's love for um, for Winston and then um, Unk's love for what was his name again? Stony. Stony. Yeah. Are the only two like I felt like really legit relationships in the whole book. Because if you look at Unk and his father, they didn't really have a relationship. Um, Beatrice and, and Winston, although they were married, didn't have any type of, you know, uh, actual, you know, what I would call a, a relationship in that they shared anything other than, you know, the home that they lived in before yeah. he wound up, you know, going out to wherever he went out to, to Titan or, or whatnot. So, yeah, there really aren't a lot of developed relationships in this story. Yeah. And I'm assuming that was intentional. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, like, it was a, it was an analysis of of people being influenced by people, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, even like Winston and his dog, the dog was always there, but you never got like a relationship kind of. It's easy to establish like the loving interplay between a person and their pet, and that never really happened. So like, it, I, I feel like yeah, it was very intentional that any any relationship that existed was either in passing or poor, you know bad or mm-hmm. just non-existent you know yep that dog was mean too and most animals <laughs> well most animals in a book unless they're they're being portrayed specifically as some type of uh you know guarding you know like a tool in the story like a guard dog or something like that they're always like really sweet and nice and, and again I, this book was written um in a time before most of the books that i've read um, yeah. so I, I that also may have been a cultural thing maybe people weren't dressing up their dogs in the oh late God. 50s and letting them eat out of the same boat, you know, played as them and, you know, some of the things we see with pet owners today. Yeah. They're, yeah, they didn't call them their fur babies or what the fuck ever. Right, yeah. yeah. So I don't know, maybe in fiction back then, dogs weren't as uh, as revered as they are in fiction today. So I have a question. Mm-hmm. And you, you, Livia, for the listeners, Livia's already sees the question, but mm-hmm. uh, at one point in the story, um, Unk... And uh, Boaz, I guess is how you would say it, is who was like one of the other people from Mars, get into a spaceship together that they think is flying them to Earth to to be a part of the attack that's being mounted on Earth. And instead, they're redirected through the machinations of that trickster Winston Niles Rumford um, to Mercury, where they end up staying for years. Um, and it's described like their arrival on Mercury and then they... The, the ship kind of navigates down and like miles and miles and miles into Mercury using sensors on the bottom of the ship that can like kind of sense what's coming and, and move. Um, uh, and then they can't get out because when they try to get the ship to leave, there's no sensors on the top. And so they, they don't know how to get the ship out of this, like almost impossible to navigate um, deep, deep kind of cave or whatever they were in. And, while while at Mercury, all these things happen, but um, they keep getting kind of clues about um, what's going on. Did you before it's revealed how to get out? Did you did you figure that out on your own? The little puzzle? Um, I did not. Um, to be honest, I didn't try. But when I saw your question in the notes, I yeah. thought to myself, I really gave it some thought, and I would have never come up with that because I, I'm still not clear on how they're able to turn a, a spaceship that could carry them. <laughs> Upside, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like logistically, I I was like, did I miss it? Well, let me think it through. Now that I know, let me ask, could I have solved it? And I was like, I would have never come up with that. Yeah, I got it right away. Like the moment they were like, 
the moment they posed that the 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 trouble was posed as there's only sensors on the bottom mm-hmm. i was like well they just need to turn it upside down yeah so it's just i'm not trying to it wasn't me being like i'm smarter than you I no, just, no. I, <laughs> it's, all, it's quite all right <laughs> i mean look if you're ever stuck on mercury if we're ever stuck on mercury likely it'll it will both be together so as long as you can figure it out then it doesn't oh, yeah. matter if i'm if i'm gonna if i'm gonna be the one I'm flipping that ship. You're going to be the one that's falling in love with like little weird like vibration leaves I liked, or whatever. I liked them. Yeah. Um, I actually, I sadly left my Kindle in the other room, but um, I had a note about them in there, just their name. But yeah, I thought they were kind of interesting uh, creatures. They were kind of harmoniums, right? Is there harmoniums? Yeah. So they were yeah. essentially like starfish that could change colors and arrange themselves in order, right? I mean, that's pretty much. Yeah. That's pretty fair accurate description but they they love music um so much so that they can overdose on it and there's just some great stuff in there about uh, boaz <laughs> um figuring out that it happens and how to keep from killing the harmoniums like he yeah. sets up a whole elaborate thing so that he can play music that they love so much and they love him for it but that you know they can also overdose on it so his his <laughs> kind of inner inner monologue on on saving them and, and the lengths he goes through is actually pretty uh, pretty adorable yeah, that was good. That was good. Um, uh, do you? I think we're good. I don't have any quotes or anything. Um, I think we examined the story pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to do wrap ups? I have a quote uh, from author Douglas Adams about the book, but I don't know where to where to put it in. So I can like let's do it after wrap ups. Got it. Um, yeah, I will go first. Um, not my first foray. Into Kurt Vonnegut, like I said, it's probably the third one, but the other ones were uh, easily 15 years ago, if not uh, if not even longer than that. So um, I kind of had an idea of the writing style, and and you know, so so none of it was a was a huge surprise. Um, this was more um, outer spacey than um, I care for, and that I'm that I'm used to um, from this author. But it did uh, you know basically serve the the interest of the story. Something interesting that occurred to me while I was reading this is that if this book felt less like a fiction story and more of like a fable. And when I say that, not just because of the things obviously pointing out the flaws in humanity or how we think or, or any of that stuff, or, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of great insight into humanity in the book. But more in the way it's told, like uh, and Rob and I talked at length about this, there's you know, there's there's very little character development. Um, there's really nobody to get attached to. We know we're supposed to be following Ankh, but really he's not. Um, likable enough, in my opinion, to, to to be a true protagonist that I like root for through the whole thing. It just uh, it it felt very much um, like a fable. Like this story isn't a story you're supposed to enjoy. This story is a story you're supposed to learn something from. And and in in that way, um, I, I think it I think it does all right. There's definitely some memorable things, and like I said, I can't. The, the guy is a solid writer with really super solid insight in, into people. Um, and and how human beings think and how human beings work and stuff. So uh, he definitely knows his source material because this wasn't about outer space and it wasn't about weird time travel and it wasn't about a guy getting a ship fixed. Really, it was about the human condition. And I think that uh, he has a really good grasp on it. Yeah, the sci-fi stuff was a little uh, heavy-handed for for my tastes. Um, but then again, any sci-fi is. Overall, I mean, I enjoyed the book. I'm going to give it four stars. Wow, that is way that's way higher than I thought you were gonna go. No, it's huh. an enjoyable story, but you you get what I mean though. How it's not like other yeah. books we read, and that it, it, it so it, so here's a book that's maybe two hundred and fifty pages. Oh, you said you read a paper copy, right? Do you know offhand? I just had it in my hand. Three hundred twenty six pages. Three hundred twenty six pages that covers what forty years. Yeah, like a lifetime, almost a lifetime. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you know what I mean. There's not a lot of time for. Right for um you know conditioning you to characters and, and small everyday interactions i mean so we've read a book here that took place in less than 24 hours and now this one has covered 40 or 50 60 years whatever it was so yeah. you know i mean there's there's a a difference in how those stories are told yeah and um yeah i'm gonna go right with you with with um like it being about the human condition it almost it's not I want like the term that comes to mind is cautionary tale, but like fable makes sense. It's just like something you learn from. So fully, fully agree with you on that. 
Um, I'm probably going to keep it short with my wrap up because a I chose the book, b huge Vonnegut fan, c I've read this book several times, so we all know I really enjoy it. Um, the thing for me that I think is so great is, um, and and I'm surprised you didn't mention it, Livius, but like the book for almost the majority of it, you don't really know why you're reading this story. And then when the whole kind of interaction on Titan at the end reveals like the um, the intentions of the Tralfamadors and everything, it all kind of clicks into place and you're like, wow, how meaningless <laughs> was everything. And so there's that kind of the, the moment of that reveal I, I found just so great. Um, and, and it kind of snaps your understanding of why the story is being told all into perspective and, and it, and it kind of forces you to reevaluate a little bit what you read. So um, I just find it to be, especially considering it was his second novel he ever wrote um, fucking incredible. And um, it definitely is, is the type of story like Livia said, you're not reading it because you're in love with the characters. Um, you're reading it because yeah, like you said, like you said, you're going to learn something from it. So love the book, always have, and I, I'm pretty sure I will continue to love it, um, assuming I'll read it again in the future sometime. So five stars. I will say, don't no slight to your love of this book. Um, I'm surprised because I don't find it to be um, the the type of book that I would consider rereadable. Funny that you should mention that. Um, it, it, well, I know that you're not typically much of a reread rereader. In general, right? Correct. Whereas I'm happy to reread stuff over and over again. Same thing with TVs and movies. I'll watch them over and over again. Uh, quote from Douglas Adams, who, uh, for people who aren't familiar, wrote the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series of books and then several other books. And um, is a, another one of my most favorite books ever, or uh, authors ever. This is what he said about the book. Sirens of Titan is just one of those books. You read it through the first time and you think it's very loosely, casually written. You think the fact that everything suddenly makes such good sense at the end is almost accidental, and then you read it a few more times, simultaneously finding out more about writing yourself, and you realize what an absolute tour de force it was, making something as beautifully honed as that appear so casual. Um, and now, now it seems like my comment was manufactured. I saw you had a, 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 a <laughs> quote from Douglas Adams, and I swear I didn't read it. That's I was great. like, all right, he's got something he wants to talk about about Douglas Adams. Like, I didn't actually read the context. Um, <laughs> yeah, I could see. I guess, I guess now that you say that, and the more I think about it, I could see that um, it would be a different. You would probably find some other things happening in it once you know the outcome. Right, you're looking for how is he setting this up. What mm -hmm. clues is he giving me? That type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So I guess in that sense, I, I, I retract what I said. I guess it probably does have some uh, <laughs> readability value from that standpoint. Uh, there you go. Sirens of Titan. We didn't even, you know what I'm disappointed about? We didn't even come up with like a, a hot seat name for, for this type of episode. Mm, yeah. It's true. I mean, we've had such successful ones in, in the past. <laughs> um. <laughs> See, we had the wheel of meat that lasted, I think, two yeah. or three episodes. Yeah, um, we had a few of those. Intro two episodes. That was three episodes. It was two episodes. Was it two? It was two yeah. episodes. We had the um, three author series. Yeah, that was two or three episodes. Yeah, there's a few of those. <laughs> so I expect to hear at least two more of these <laughs> throwback episodes. We've had, I think, three of those. Right? Yeah, I think we just and, did our third. Yeah, and well, well, yeah, I don't even. But this is a different class. This is uh no. I mean, uh, our our their our most recent throwback was the third one. Oh, I got not you. this yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, I got you. Yeah, yeah. so th I mean, this essentially winds up being a throwback and <laughs> something else, right? Because we're obviously going back in someone's catalog. Yeah. So this kind of fills both. Anyway, uh, maybe we'll come up with a name for this. Um, you know, give us some feedback. Um, do you want us to to review like the big books from? I mean. You know, we'll read the feedback. I don't know that we'll take it. That's kind of how we um, how we roll. So yeah. I don't really have much of anything else um, this week. You got anything going on? Well, I I, I want to say in the in the theme of talking about Kurt Vonnegut, um, we 
uh, along with Richard Thomas and Chris Deal, I want to say this was back in, what, 2012, actually visited the Kurt Vonnegut Memorial Library in Indianapolis. Um, downtown Indiana. Downtown Indiana, yeah. That was a fun little experience. Like, I was fanboying like crazy. Livia uh, was enjoying, I believe, but not like going nuts about it. Um, you know, I, I thought it was really cool, but it's it's it, it's weird. So it's the only time I've gone to a, you know, whatever shrine to, to a writer. Yeah. And it's really when you realize how boring the process of writing. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Like, so let's go a different way. If, if, if we went to like a George Lucas museum, right, there'd be a good chance that we'd see like an original lightsaber and, um, you know, uh, what are those called? Um, cells, like original cells yeah. from oh, Star yeah, Wars. Yeah. And you'd see all this like cool memorabilia. And we go to this place and it was kind of cool, but they're like, here's an unopened pack of cigarettes. This is no joke. Here's an unopened pack of cigarettes that was found behind a radiator in his house. Yeah. Here's a typewriter that he wrote, you know, probably wrote, I think, I don't even think it committed, probably wrote, you know, Cat's Cradle on. It was the same, I know what you're talking about, it was the same model as the, it wasn't even the original one, it was yeah, the same so, model that he used. Yeah. So literally, it's, you know what I mean, like. But then it, they had some of his, like, war medals and stuff like that from yeah. when he was in World War II. Well, they had II, his so rejection, like, he had some, yeah. some it's rejection letters, and, and that was cool, but you, you know what I mean, it, it's, it, it was, it was cool. It's not glamorous. <laughs> No, yeah, you really realize that you're like, oh, look, there's a sweater that he liked to wear when it was cold. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like this weird, I don't know. Yeah. 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 That's a fun yeah. little experience. Yep. And and um, the only other note, did you ever see the movie Back to School with uh, Rodney Dangerfield? I, I did not. I, I know what it is, but I did. Uh, I did not. I always kind of fondly think about that because I'm sure I watched it when it was, you know, a new movie back in the day. But um. Uh, being a Vonnegut fan now, it's fun because he goes like Roddy Dangerfield's an adult. He goes back to college for some fucking reason, whatever. And um, one of the things in the course of his studies is he has to write a paper on Kurt Vonnegut. But he's this super rich dude that just doesn't like want to be bothered with shit. So he actually gets Kurt Vonnegut to write the paper about Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> Kurt That's Vonnegut. really funny. And um so there's a scene where he's actually in the movie where he, the, you know, uh, he knocks on the door and the door opens and he's like, I'm Kurt Vonnegut. I'm here for so-and-so. But then later in the movie, uh, Roddy Dangerfield is talking to the teacher and she's like, I know you didn't write that Vonnegut paper, but whoever did doesn't know the first thing about Kurt Vonnegut. And then he calls Kurt Vonnegut and he's like chewing him out on the phone and he's, and he's like, Oh yeah, fuck you. So like implying Kurt Vonnegut told him, fuck you on the phone. That is uh, that is really funny. Um, it's Kurt Vonnegut. He looks like like Einstein, right? Am I picturing the right guy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Kind of a uh, crazy haired. Yeah. Old looking dude. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I was just trying to put in my head that that was that was getting the right the the right image of of the guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's it. That's uh, <laughs> I think that that closes out the the Kurt Vonnegut chapter of books, right? Unless he comes out with a new book. Well, well, what is on the horizon for Kurt Vonnegut? Do we have anything coming? Uh, anything you know? No, I mean I'm sure that they're going to re-release things and and release un un previously unreleased stuff. But um, I, yeah, I, yeah. So I'm I have a question. Still dead. Um, how are you? Um, are you familiar with like? Are there a ton of Kurt Vonnegut um, movies made from his books? Um, several of his movies have been adapted very poorly um, throughout the years. Um, I don't think that there's ever been one that was like really really well done um this book actually was there's uh the sirens of titan he, he sold the option for the movie to jerry garcia like <laughs> back when the grateful dead i'm assuming in the 70s or whatever yeah um who uh i don't remember the exact story but it's funny if you ever want to like look it up um but like it never got made because it just was never gonna be like what it should be but um yeah last i heard jerry garcia owned the rights to the film rights to this book he sold it to him for two ties and three tabs of acid. Is that, are you, did you make that I up? No, or? I, no, no, I made that up. I have no idea. <laughs> I know Jerry Garcia had a tie um, company and, and I'm going to, are they, oh, there are tabs of acid, that. right? Yeah. There are tabs of acid, right? That's I don't know. I never did acid. Okay. So, so, uh, yeah. It could have been like two binders of acid. I've been like, well, that, that sounds, that sounds right. <laughs> nice. You got binders full of acid. Binders. <laughs> It's a throwback so, politics joke right there. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. No kidding. Um, that's it. I'm done. I got nothing else. 
No, we should just probably talk about what's coming up next because we know. Um, Rob, would you like to know what the next three episodes are? I'm dying to know what the next three episodes are. All right. So three weeks from now, <laughs> it's really building up the suspense. We are going to be reading We Sold Our Souls by Grady Hendrix. This was a book that was uh, sent to me by a friend of the podcast, Jesse, who got an advanced reader copy because he gets more advanced reader copies than we do, or at least a better, better, better ones. Than... Yeah. And this is a uh, novel of supernatural horror and pop culture by the author of Horror Store, spelled um, horror and then S-T-O with the little dots above it, R, like, you know, like Motley Crue or whatever. Mm -hmm. My Best Friend's Exorcism and Paperbacks from Hell. This is a uh, heavy metal band horror story. <laughs> um, so we're going to be doing that in three weeks. In two weeks, I'm very, very pleased and very excited to say that we will be interviewing the author of what I believe is the best book that we've read this year, um, Baby Teeth. Zoya Stage will be joining us for an interview. Super exciting. Very cool. And next week, we will be reviewing a book called Cherry by Nico Walker. Um, this book is uh, stands out a little bit in that it apparently, and, and we'll have more details about this, I'm sure, as we read the book, um, is semi-autobiographical and was written by a cat who's still currently in prison. So, spoiler alert, Rob, I think I know how this book ends. You uh, think the pro tag's going to jail? I think the program pro tag's going to prison. I got gotcha. you. Oh, wait. What's the difference between jail and prison? Jail is the local place that they send you. And um, unless things have changed in the, the time since I studied criminal justice, uh, two year and under sentence is served in jail. Two years and above or whatever. Above two years is served in prison. OK. Which one's the clink? <laughs> uh, that would be prison would be the clink. Gotcha. So whenever you see a movie, no movie has ever taken place in jail. Jail is lame. Like jail's not dangerous. <laughs> well, because like like people don't stab each other in jail because then you go down for murder and you go to prison. So when you're in jail, yeah. you're like, all right, I've got 18 months or I've got 12 months or, or, or whatever. So there's no you know what I mean? I, I shouldn't say that it never happens, but you get what I'm saying. The stories aren't as interesting when you're temporarily. It's not 20 to life. You know what I mean? So in Banshee, that was jail in, that was prison the, well no he got out of prison but then he was the sheriff and the sheriff oh, yeah. had the, yes those mm -hmm. cells those were jail cells yes. okay yes correct yeah well and that's probably yeah. more accurately that's probably like local holding like somebody who was convicted yeah. of something would probably go to a bigger place so like, like we county. have jails like yeah, yeah exactly gotcha i didn't so, know you uh, studied criminal justice i was just fucking with you <laughs> really are you serious i never we didn't we never talked about this i'm guessing kind of, not i'm yeah all right yeah, I mean, I for a few semesters when I was a, a much younger, a much younger Livius. You have a, um, a much more interesting life than me. So, um, but yeah, so at any rate, uh, yeah, I get the feeling he's going to end up in prison, just like the author. So at any rate, I will uh, also um, let you and readers know, I'm at like 72% of this book. That that power outage last night got me jumpstarted on next week's no book. I'm, I'm almost done with it. So, yeah, <laughs> I had the day off today, too. So I... And I read like 30% last night while there was no power. And then I, uh, I read another 40% today. So I'm, I'm pretty much ready to review it. That title cherry always makes me think of, um, there's a band called the chromatics and they have a song called cherry and I really enjoy it. Yeah. So, there you go. This is, I'm going to read a couple of the blurbs. Jesus's son meets reservoir dogs in a breakneck pace debut novel about love, war, bank robberies, and heroin. Vulture magazine says Nico Walker's Cherry might be the first great novel of the opioid epidemic. Yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, that I mean, I, I read the prologue so far, so I'm no power outage Livius, um, but I'm excited. Um, I like the, the tone of it so far, uh, so I'm excited to get into it. But um, I think it's going to wrap it up for this um, first ever whatever you're going to call this type of episode, right? Yeah. Greatest hits. <sighs> Should we call it greatest Ooh, hits episode? Greatest hits episode. Yeah. Or hit? I don't know. Well, we'll, we'll smooth we'll that work one on out. It. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's it. Join us uh, next week for Cherry. And until then, I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snudden. Keep reading. <laughs>